in the courts and Alex's family, but most of all, Alex's parents. I want to say how sorry I am that they have lost their son. But sorry doesn't cut it in my mind. That word is not enough and never will be enough for this loss. And I recognize that. I don't think I could ever find words that will be enough to express this, especially to them. The pain they feel is unimaginable. I want to express how sorry I am for this loss because it is such a great loss. I recognize and completely acknowledge this pain and I'm so sorry. I loved Alex very much and I also feel a great loss and I'm so sorry and thank you for letting me say this. Thank you. All right. Anybody, you, anybody need a recess? Um, we're prepared for the court to proceed if you would like to proceed at this time. How about the state? Anybody need a recess? No. No? Okay. You're okay. All right. Well, <clears throat> whew. first of all, I think... Uh, uh, just because of some of the terms that have been thrown around here today. Uh, it's important that people understand how this works in Wisconsin. Normally, a uh, court at a sentencing would have to consider probation, but probation is not an option, so it cannot be considered uh, in a first-degree intentional homicide case. So the court is, uh, and, and, we, and we do not have a death penalty. We're not a death penalty state, so uh, none of those things are... Uh, are in play. I think during the career of Ms. Vishni and myself, and Mr. DeFore, um, we've seen three different eras of uh, sentencing law. We had indeterminate sentencing. And that was back, uh, I can't even remember when TIS 1 or Truth and Sentencing 1 came along, but prior to that, a uh, person sentenced to life imprisonment would have eligibility for parole after about 13.9 years. I think that was in the defense brief, but I, I, if I recall it, I think that's correct. And, um, and it would be a parole board that would decide whether a person would get parole or not. And uh, I think it was also cited in the defense memoranda that often people would end up serving between 18 and 21 years uh, before, uh, that was sort of the average, I would imagine. And, um, but there was a, uh, a period of time uh, where I guess it, it, it began in the uh, 1990s or late 1980s, I think, the, the tough on crime and things spiraled up and both political parties in this state uh, tried to keep ahead of each other and being tougher on crime and so forth. And part of that was life means life. It started with a uh, court being able to determine a court, a sentencing court, being able to determine a parole eligibility date. Again, if it was parole, that's why I mentioned that it, it, this isn't a parole case because um, that's a different, we'd be under a different law. And uh, in any event, so that was, I believe, part of Truth in Sentencing 1, which would be the, the first change from indeterminate to determinate sentencing. And um, in any event, then uh, it was a court determining when the parole eligibility date would be sometime in the future or whether someone would uh, not be eligible for parole. And, uh, and that was a, a pretty big change, and, and, and it was politically driven. This is what we have to understand. This is what the people of the state wanted. And I think there was a general sentiment that, you know, 20 years uh, for uh, intentional homicide wasn't enough. At least that's my read. Has been my read um, through through the years, um, and uh, again, you have there are some people that would like to see a death penalty for an intentional homicide, and there's states that have that, and the federal government has that. We don't have that. Um, so even in uh, with the enactment of the life mean life life means life, and then we move into the truth and sentencing two era, which was right around 2000, as Ms. Vishni mentioned. And um, then uh, it was changed so that rather than parole, we have extended supervision and the court can determine generally in a sentence, bifurcated sentence. And this wouldn't be a bifurcated sentence, as I understand it. Um, and, um, but still, a court could determine when a person would be eligible for 
petitioning a court for extended supervision, which would be similar to parole in the sense that a person would be released on conditions and so forth and would be subject to supervision, could have extended supervision revoked if they didn't follow the rules and could be returned to serve a life sentence. And even in the era when they said life didn't mean life, life still could mean life. I mean, there's a person that I had prosecuted that is still in prison. That's from the 1980s. Not in prison, actually, in one of the state institutions, NGI case. So life could mean life. Life can mean life now. And the legislature gave that authority to the courts to make that decision. But the way the law is and what this court has to address is there's three options. Number one, the court can find under Section 973.014, subsection 1GA, that a person could be eligible for release to extended supervision after serving 20 years. Number two, a date for eligibility for release on extended supervision on a date set by the court sometime in the future. Or three, that a person is not eligible for release to extended supervision. And the way that it would work for a petition for extended supervision is that a person would have to file a petition sometime not more than 90 days, as I understand, before their eligibility date. And then it would be the court. And again, you're absolutely correct, Ms. Vishnu. It would not be this person, but it would be this court, whoever is sitting here, that would either hold a hearing or could deny it without a hearing. The district attorney would have an opportunity if the court directed to have a hearing on this. But the burden would be on the defendant to show that they're not a danger or so on and so forth. And there could be conditions and so on. But I think that is the defendant would have to prove by clear and convincing evidence that they are not a danger to the public. So what the legislature essentially has said, and Ms. Vishnu, I think you're correct, is that the person has to serve at least 20 years. And then, you know, if a court were to say you're eligible at that time, and obviously it would be sometime after that. But also the legislature said, again, as the state has recommended here, that there not be eligibility at all for extended supervision. So you would have essentially life without the possibility of any sort of release. So that's what the court has before it. And Ms. McCandless has been convicted after a trial to a jury, first degree intentional homicide. It is the most serious crime that we have in this state. And, again, we talked here at length about being a mandatory life sentence and with those options. So the court is of the belief, and I think both parties agree, that the court is to consider the galleon sentencing factors when making a determination as to when someone would be eligible, if eligible, for extended supervision. And I think those factors, as I see them, are three overall factors, seriousness or gravity of the offense, number two, character of the person being sentenced or their rehabilitative needs, and three, protection of the public. And there are other factors, aggravating, mitigating factors in there. But in any event, those are the three overall considerations. So, as I've already touched on, the maximum penalty being life in prison without the possibility of extended supervision. So it is a very, very serious, very, very serious offense. It doesn't get any more serious. And in this particular case, I think it's also appropriate, as in others, not only to look at what the maximum penalties are, but to look at the conduct of a person. Now, I can't address what a different judge in a different county did under different circumstances, and those are certainly not precedents for the court. 
Um, and uh, but in any event, so I focus on this particular case. And uh, this was uh, a brutal uh, homicide. There's no question about it. Um, and it would have been, and it's just awful, awful for the family to have to see these pictures. Uh, and uh, but what happened to Alexander Woodworth um, was it was a, a terrible, terrible uh, crime. And uh, he was uh, it had to have uh, suffered a great deal of pain and suffering. Uh, before he died, nobody really knows how long he he would have lived after he was stabbed the first time, and frankly, nobody really knows what happened or what was discussed or what sparked this. Uh, but as far as the crime is concerned, and I'll I'll come back to that uh, in a moment as it relates to the character of Ms. McCandless, as as this court sees it, um, and um, and so this is. Uh, in addition to the brutal nature, uh, and who knows, again, if he, if he was already dead when she left uh, the scene or where his body was, or whether uh, uh, you know he was still alive and laying there. But the uh, fact of the matter is, uh, and I believe the jury's verdict, uh, and, and you've addressed this yourself, Ms. Fishney, the jury's verdict tells us that they did not believe Ms. McCandless. They did not believe it was self-defense. There's no doubt that she killed Alexander Woodworth. There's no doubt in this court's mind that she intended to kill him. And uh, the verdict is it was not uh, privilege. It was not self-defense, imperfect or perfect. So, and that brings me to Ms. McCandless's conduct. And uh, I'm sure that she was not the person uh, when this occurred, that her family knows and loves. I mean, there's obviously there's a lot of good things about her uh, in her life, and and uh, but uh, she was not cooperative. She was not truthful. Um, and I guess maybe take that back a little bit. She was cooperative to some extent, but she was not truthful. She lied uh, when the uh, initial emergency responders were there. She lied at the hospital. She lied to uh, uh, Detective Prock on a couple of occasions. Uh, uh, Judge, yes. respectfully, and I, I hate to interrupt the court, but I am aware of recent cases, and ones before the Supreme Court, uh, that requires defense counsel potentially to interrupt the court to preserve the record. Sure, go so ahead. So that's why I'm doing it. Um, and, and the court is addressing at this point her post offense conduct and I did neglect to mention um, there's no question that Miss McCandless lied to Detective Proc um, and uh, was not truthful with him and and I don't know if the court was going to discuss um, other factors but I had meant to call the court's attention to the fact that Miss McCandless did have a history of post-traumatic stress disorder including after a rather minor vehicle accident um, going through a dissociative state where McCandless did not recall McCandless's name and referred to herself as Monica Carlin and asked where the horse was even though it was a single vehicle accident and I did neglect to mention that um, in that's so the immediate aftermath um, of, and the court didn't allow the jury to hear about that I I'm not hazarding any guesses uh, that'll be for appellate lawyers but I should have mentioned that during my sentencing since you're discussing lack of truthfulness All right. thank you and I apologize right. for well, the interruption I, I, I certainly don't fault uh, defense counsel for doing their job and uh, you know I I don't know that I'm going to be able to touch on every point that should be addressed here today and we'd be here all day long and I know that this is getting a little bit long and uh, but I, in any event um, this court heard the evidence, and, and uh, there's, frankly, uh, Ms. McCandless was, was not truthful, and that's what the jury found. I, I think that's a, that's a fact, and, uh, you know, we'll never really know for sure what happened. We will never know for sure. And part of the fascination about this case, it's obviously uh, gotten a lot of attention and there's a lot of interest in this case because I think a lot of people want to know, they want to know what happened, they want to know why. And, uh, but we'll never really know for sure what happened. Even if Ms. McCandless 
told yet another story, which uh, I, I think would be hard hard to believe it. I don't think we'll ever know, and the family will never really know uh, the truth about what happened to Alex and how it happened and why it happened and so on. But in any event, I'm going to continue on talking about the seriousness of the offense. So it's serious by maximum penalty, the most serious offense, and in this particular case, it was, uh, again, to parse or to sort out the difference between intentional homicides is very difficult. Um, you know, it's a little like trying to see a shadow in the dark. Um, it's just difficult to do. First degree intentional homicide, uh, they're all, all bad and all serious crimes. There's no question about that. So, move on to the second, the character of the person being sentenced and rehabilitative needs. And I can tell you, I, I don't think, you know, rehabilitative needs of Ms. McCandless is the driver in this particular case. Um, what I see in this particular case, and I think this is uh, addresses two areas. Um, you know, one, uh, talking about this crime, even Ms. Nodolf on her argument, she's saying, well, this just seems so irrational. Um, and I think people struggle to understand what reason there would be for Ms. McCandless to, uh, to kill uh, Alexander Woodworth. But there's no question that, and I'd just like to note that I have uh, Exhibit 365 and 366, and that was uh, silence broken as redacted, as well as uh, the journal number two. And I, I think those two documents, uh, those writings by Ms. McCandless, uh, frankly, I think shed a lot of light. She was in a very dark place. She had had an awful lot of, first of all, she was uh, 20 and a half years old when this happened. Six months before that, um, she had gone through, uh, again, this, uh, this procedure, which undoubtedly left uh, uh, some turmoil uh, with her. And uh, these relationships, the choices that she made, frankly, she made a lot of very poor choices. You know, we're free to make choices. And, uh, you know, when you're an adult, uh, even though you're not, you know, fully developed, and I totally acknowledge the brain science, you know, they train judges on this stuff. In fact, our last judicial conference was almost entirely devoted to the mind sciences, and we heard plenty of that in this case. But uh, as pointed out, uh, and I just want to address the issue about the dissociative state. As I understand it, the jury did hear about that through Dr. Benson. And uh, uh, that was, uh, he talked about her history of PTSD. And that's my recollection, is that, that uh, uh, that's why, that's part of the reason the court didn't, didn't allow it. But the record was made at the time as to the reasons, and, and that, again, I, I have no doubt that there will be an appeal in this case, and, and there's, there are so many issues. Uh, the defense can raise, and they will be addressed at that time. Um, however, uh, from what this court could tell, um, Ms. McCandless had all sorts of things going on, these relationships that she was involved in, uh, her own, whatever, her own internal turmoil about what her identity was, uh, her sexual identity, who she was as a person, uh, what she wanted in life. And um, in this... Uh, on page four of five, this is document 521, silence is broken. And uh, this is a line that is sort of stuck in my head. Um, I feel like my mind is on fire. And this was written, I'm not sure how long uh, before this homicide. Um, as I understand, it was last, I guess, closed or uh, opened uh, or viewed just a few days prior to this homicide. Um, journal number two, um, Exhibit 366, she talks about the first line, my mind is deeply haunted by the actions I've done. So she talks about waves of guilt and so on and so forth, pain, regret, disgust, and the word confused comes up in a number of different places. She had an awful lot going on uh, in her mind, and uh, she obviously was angry with Alexander Woodworth. The evidence that came from the communications between Ms. McCandless and uh, Jason Mengel 
which uh, comes from uh, document number 551 and that's uh, exhibit 465 and uh, would have been about 10 days roughly 10 days before this homicide and uh, she's talking to Jason Mangle about wanting to go and and uh, confront Alex tell tell him and now this is uh, from one of the communications I just want to give it back and stay stay out of my life and tell him how much I regret meeting him and there are a couple of times during those communications where she talks about um, one I'm afraid I might punch him though if he gives me a look um, Another line, to be honest, I might punch him in the face if he does a sarcastic, your dumb voice. And these are communications Ms. McCandless had with Mr. Banker. So the night before uh, this all happens, uh, Mr. Mangle sends a words, you know, in the court's opinion, that seems to be sort of a straw that or the last spark that set off this tumultuous, these tumultuous feelings that she had. And uh, the next day, Alexander Woodworth ends up dead. And so when she's talking to Detective Proc, uh, they ask her why, or he asks her, why did you go to talk to Alex? And she says, I wanted to talk about my feelings, so my mind is on fire, or feel like my mind is on fire. Uh, they didn't elaborate on what those feelings were, um, but obviously she had anger and some pent-up rage and a whole lot of other things that were going on. And uh, she also wanted to talk to him about what was on the restroom wall at Racy's. So, uh, and what he knew about that and so on. Now, frankly, uh, I, I agree with the defense that the court has to sentence based on the facts as they have occurred. And I think the analysis as far as what the evidence is, as the jury found that she killed Alex. She had the intent to kill him. She didn't find, the jury didn't find when that intent was formed. And uh, frankly, in this court's mind, and I had a lot of time to think about this case, and uh, believe me, I've thought about it a lot. There was uh, perhaps, again, suicidal ideations, perhaps homicidal ideations, but the evidence proves that when she killed Alex Woodworth, she had the intent to kill him. And uh, and in large part um, had her what was going on in her life and her being immature um, again being only 20 and a half years of age uh, certainly I don't think anyone could disagree that in the science that her prefrontal cortex was not fully developed uh, that she didn't have very good breaks and uh, Jason Mangle suggested she not go do that he didn't want to go along um, she had asked Jason in those communications to go along because she wants to tell Alex off. And then that's before the business about the uh, learning about her number being on Racy's in the bathroom wall. So, um, frankly, uh, from this court's perspective, what we know is that she boiled over at some point and killed Alex Woodworth. And uh, it was not in self-defense. And she lied about what happened, which is, frankly, not that uncommon. Um, she is a person that does have her, her personality traits. Uh, there's a lot of good things people have said about her, people that have known her, and there's probably a lot of good things that she could do, you know, in a prison setting. Um, and, uh, but the fact still remains that, um, you know, we talk about five to ten years of rehabilitation, you know, maybe that's in some cases. Most people that go to prison, they aren't even there for more than a couple of years, frankly. Um, but this is, again, this is an intentional homicide case. So that brings me to the third factor the court has to consider, and that is, of course, protecting the public. And we can't predict the future, but the best predictor about the future is what people have done in the past. And uh, so we have, again, in this particular case, uh, someone who uh, killed another person, took another life. And, uh, and I think that's, uh, you know, the public expects... Uh, to be protected, uh, we don't know. We can't. I can't. Uh, 
I can't tell right now whether she's going to be dangerous 20 years from now or 25 or 40 uh, or more. So in any event, um, court has to consider those factors when uh, imposing a sentence in this case. Um, now, what the court has considered uh, for purposes of sentencing would be, again, some exhibits from the record. I've received the pre-sentence investigation report, which recommends uh, life imprisonment with uh, eligibility for extended supervision at, at 50 years. And uh, I've considered the state's sentencing memorandum and their arguments and the people that uh, have spoken here today, um, the victim input uh, side of things. and. Uh, the state's position is life in prison, imprisonment, uh, never an opportunity for uh, extended supervision. And then uh, the defense argument, of course, life imprisonment in your sentencing memoranda, uh, some letters that were contained in that, as well as uh, some pictures, pictures of Ezra with uh, interacting with family and so on and so forth, uh, and is asking for uh, extended supervision at the earliest possible uh, time. And, uh, Judge, I hate to interrupt, but we're asking for the opportunity to petition a court. Yes, exactly. And that's, that's I think, for people to understand that the court is, would not be uh, setting a, a release date here today, just a date when a person would be eligible for extended supervision. So, um, What the court has not seen in this particular case, uh, you know, I'm just going to go through some factors in order here. Her past records, she didn't have any prior criminal convictions. Um, and frankly, there was no evidence of uh, prior violent behavior uh, that this court heard. Um, and she was only 20 and a half years old, not far out of high school. and. Uh, Again, I've already mentioned the nature of the crime itself here. And, uh, but what the court saw during the trial was she did not, there, there does not appear to be any remorse, does not appear to be any genuine contrition. Um, and, and I just want to make sure they make it clear that not holding it against Ms. McCandless, that she did not say anything to the PSI writer. Again, she has a right to appeal, uh, and um, she has a right to remain silent. That cannot be held against her at sentencing. Um, but what I'm talking about is what she testified to and what she said, what was testified that she had said to investigators. And uh, But there... Uh, and I don't know, maybe a little bit today, I don't really feel like it was real, really sincere. I'm sure she feels bad, but I, I, again, I don't believe we have the truth. And I think one thing a family would want to have more than anything else is to know what the real, what the truth was. And, and, I, and I don't want to, I guess, forget to mention, you know, uh, that this is, in the court's opinion, has to do with uh, the family, the victim, uh, and by definition, close family members are victims of this offense, and their input is important. And uh, the uh, so court allowed evidence by the defense. Uh, I believe that's based on the, on the law, at least this court's interpretation of the law, and uh, as characterized uh, by some as a, an assassination of Alex's character, um, and uh, and. It, Frankly, people are entitled to put on a defense, um, and uh, but again, those facts and that testimony it was rejected by the jury. There is no evidence that Alex Woodworth had done anything wrong at all, um, and from all accounts, even from what Ms. McCandless says, um, aside from what she testified to, uh, he was a kind person, gentle person. Uh, witty, compassionate, um, just so many adjectives uh, that I've heard about what a good person that he was, and uh, and, and I and I don't doubt that. Um, and uh, so this is a, a great loss not only for his family, for his friends, his community, 
Uh, but it's very tragic. And uh, I agree with Ms. Gunnelson when she says there, no one wins in this case. Nobody, nobody wins in this case. Um, this is just a horrible, 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 horrible case. And, um, and that is the way it is. So after considering all of these factors, uh, and uh, I just, again, I just want to say that I've thought about this case pretty consistently, I, you know, for a long time. And, uh, and, when, uh, and I understood, you know, what the court's choices were because I looked at the statute quite a while ago before I received the pre-sentence investigation report. And uh, in, in this court's opinion, I had thought this is a case where there should be some date for uh, release on extended supervision. But I cannot agree with the defense because I think 20 years is, would certainly unduly depreciate the seriousness of this offense. From my view, from the community that I serve, and again, this isn't, a, this isn't my personal spot here. This is on behalf of the community. And, uh, and in this court's opinion, uh, that would unduly depreciate the seriousness of a first-degree intentional homicide for someone uh, to be out uh, that soon, uh, rehabilitated or not, uh, the seriousness of a first degree intentional homicide, at least by community standards, in this court's opinion, uh, requires more than that. However, I do not believe, and there are a couple of cases that I've been, I was the prosecutor on where people got life uh, without, uh, without realistic possibility of parole, one without possibility of parole. Uh, I certainly haven't been involved in as many homicide cases as you have, Ms. Vishni, um, and I'm, I guess I'm glad for that uh, because they are not, uh, and there's nothing pleasant about it at all. Um, but in any event, um, the court believes in, uh, that the date uh, that the pre-sentence investigator, writer of the report, Mr. Erickson, frankly, when I got the pre-sentence investigation report, that was a number that's right, right around what this court was thinking. It's gone up, it's gone down, it's gone back and forth a little bit. Um, Mr. Hall's comment that you know maybe 60 years, uh, you know one one year for every day they had to wait. Uh, and this again, this is this whole situation is difficult on everybody. You know, having uh, the publicity in a case like this, uh, it's difficult on the family. Um, uh, you know, and. Uh, Having to wait to have a loved one's body because you're concerned about uh, it being preserved for evidence and that the defense might at some time, you know, object that potentially exculpatory evidence may have been uh, lost because the body was returned to the family. And uh, I think in every case we learn a little bit. Uh, it's unfortunate. Frankly, I, I don't recall that. And it's, uh, it's, uh, it's difficult. It's difficult for the family to have to be uh, you know, on, on TV and, uh, uh, and all that uh, it sort of changes the way people behave, I think, when you get this much coverage. And, uh, and that, you know, I mean, the coverage is here to capture what's, what happens, but yet what happens sometimes changes a little bit because of the coverage. And, uh, but I have never been involved in a homicide case that did not have TV cameras in the courtroom uh, in Wisconsin. That's, that's the way it is. So um, the court believes, uh, and here, here's what the court is going to do for the reasons that I've stated. Uh, I am going to sentence Ms. McCandless to uh, uh, life in prison in the Wisconsin prison system, and I'm going to uh, set the date that she would be eligible for uh, petitioning the court for extended supervision at 50 years. It's a long time, but the way I reason this at Ms. McCandless, if she does what she's supposed to do, uh, follows the rules um, that she at least has some light at the end of a very long tunnel. It's a long time. I won't be around. I'm pretty sure I'm going to be gone, like dead at that point. <coughs> um, and, uh, but I think I've thought about that for a number of different reasons. I think that way that uh, Alex's parents you know, <coughs> don't know exactly how old they are, how long they have yet to live, but that spares them uh, to have to see the day. <coughs> Ms. McCandless may uh, petition to be released and uh, perhaps have to go through some hearings. 
it's a long time down the road and does not unduly depreciate the seriousness of this offense in the court's opinion. And uh, if this was a death penalty state, uh, there would be no opportunity ever for that. But this is an intentional homicide and it is that serious in this court's opinion. I think people expect, uh, if maybe not an entire natural life, um, but uh, <coughs> at least if 50 years is a point where I think most people can agree uh, that would not unduly depreciate the seriousness of, of the offense and she would most likely not be a risk to the public after uh, a very lengthy period such as that. Um, as far as the sentencing credit goes, um, the state said 683 days. That would date from the date of the first appearance or when bail was set. But if you date it from <coughs> the date that she was taken into custody by law enforcement, it would be 692 days or March 18th of 2018. And I think the date she was taken into custody was March 27, 2018. No, she was taken homicide. into custody at Mr. Sipple's residence. She was never free to leave after being at Mr. Sipple's residence. No, she was not in police custody. She was not arrested on this offense, as I understand it, until March 27th. That's my finding. So, um, and I added it up. I come up with 683 days credit, including okay, well, my records preserved, including today. Yep, yeah, certainly. Um, so, I am required, Ms. McCandless, to advise you of some information. You will get a copy of this <coughs> written explanation of determinate life sentence. Uh, again, your length of your sentence is life imprisonment, and. Uh, You would be eligible to petition for release to extended supervision after serving 50 years, zero months. And um, I think you can read for yourself about extended confinement or bad time. I don't normally read that at a sentencing. Um, but I think uh, the statute does require that I advise you of this information. And that is from section 302.114 of the Wisconsin statutes. And um, yeah, actually, in any event, the court is supposed to read that information is contained in this form, which is uh, CR 235. And again, a copy will be put in here, will provide it to your to the jail for your personal belongings, but you may file a petition for release to extend its supervision with this court. The petition cannot be filed earlier than 90 days before your extended supervision eligibility date. If your petition is filed any time earlier than the 90 days, the court will deny the petition without a hearing. You must serve a copy of your petition on the district attorney's office and the district attorney will file a written response to your petition within 45 days after receiving the petition. The court will review your petition in any response filed by the district attorney and may grant or deny your petition without a hearing. If the court holds a hearing, the hearing will be before the court without a jury. The district attorney who prosecuted you will represent the state at this hearing. Now, again, I don't know who the district attorney will be 50 years from now, but it would be the Don County District Attorney. That's the point. Before this court can grant or deny your petition, any victim or any other person may make or submit a statement relevant to your release to extended supervision. This court cannot grant your petition unless you prove by clear and convincing evidence that you are not a danger to the public. If your petition is granted, this court may impose conditions on the term of extended supervision. If this court denies your petition, it will set a date on which you may file another petition. If it is filed prior to the date set by the court, it may be denied without a hearing. You may appeal an order denying your petition for release to extended supervision. Now, uh, <coughs> A number of other things uh, may seem like formalities. I, the court does have to impose court costs in this matter. I believe it would be $268 plus a $250 DNA surcharge. That's a total of uh, $518. I'm also going to order 
uh, restitution. The restitution would be, first of all, to Marvin and Joan Woodworth for cost of travel and cost of funeral. Uh, uh, cost of travel, uh, $1,602.30. Cost of funeral, $3,940. And then uh, also for Sarah Woodworth for missed work for a funeral. And that's calculated out at $312. And uh, travel from Nebraska, $458.89 for a total of $6,313.19. And there's a victim witness surcharge of 10% added onto that for a total of $6,944.51. Now I understand that's not contested, and that court, uh, but the court believes that those are reasonable uh, expenses uh, for restitution for the untimely death of Alexander Woodworth. Uh, you know, and if things went as they should, his parents, uh, or grandparents or anybody shouldn't have to pay for his funeral uh, and hopefully that you know his funeral should have been well after his parents were gone now um, so the court will order that um, you may request a restitution hearing if you wish um, I will order that um, uh, up to the maximum amount allowed by law that there may be deductions from any prison wages to pay towards restitution and court costs and uh, again, uh, counsel indicated that was 50 percent. I I thought it was 25 percent, but it yeah. was it was 25 percent. Just raised it to 50. I believe, 50. I believe 50. It's now 50. Okay, so I'll order up to 50 percent of any. I guess it's any amounts in her accounts in the prison. Uh, it's not just prison wages, but it's also it's taken from other money she funds. may have. Prison funds. Um, now other. Uh, Conditions now. I'm not. I'll, I will order it, and if it's not allowed, it's not allowed. But I will order that uh, she have no contact with uh, Mr. Woodward's family. Well, Judge, uh, I'm going to ask for modification. Of that I'd ask that she be not be allowed to initiate any contact with Mr. Woodward's family. I'm aware that there's a restorative justice program that goes on in the state of Wisconsin, and sometimes in the future, victims' families want to go through a restorative justice hearing. So I would not want that to be precluded by today's sentencing 